Tonight, we are honored that Mr. Hitchens is here to discuss his new book, Thomas Jefferson, Author of America. Mr. Hitchens will entertain questions on other topics as well. Ladies and gentlemen, Christopher Hitchens. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, comrades and friends, if I can go that far. <laughs> yes, good. Uh, for coming. Um, I should add that uh, to the very fine list of compliments that Dennis just regaled you with, that I was recently called by Mr. George Galloway, a member of British Member of Parliament, a principal lobbyist for the Iraqi Ba'ath Party, and defender of the, f of the forces of jihad and profiteer from the oil for food scandal, that I was a drink-sodden ex-Trotskyist popinje. <laughs> Some of which was unfair. Um, there is another saying from Roman antiquity, now I think of it. I think it's from Virgil. It says, uh, Mutato nomine et de te fabula narrator. Change only the name, and this story is about you. And I include this in my study of Mr. Jefferson because it seems to me that anyone interested in the, the American experiment, the American Revolution, and in the multiple contradictions that arise from it, both personal and political, has to be interested in him. And since I know that people come to stores of this exalted kind not just to listen but to speak, and I'm counting on it, I'll, I'll, be, I'll be brief, and you'll forgive me my condensation, but I'll say why I think this applies and how, um, under just a few headings, the Enlightenment, the revolution, uh, war, and nation building, and slavery. Um, uh, Philadelphia in the late 18th century was not perhaps exactly fifth century Athens, but it was an extraordinary magnet for intellectuals and scientists and rationalists and philosophers. Uh, all of them, in my opinion, definable as men of the Enlightenment and the Enlightenment definable simply like this. Once people have worked out that God is not going to help you, uh, that you're, to that extent, on your own, there may be a God, but he doesn't care about you. You have to take your own responsibility. That's what the Enlightenment means. Where religion ends, civilization begins, approximately. Once you've worked that out, then a huge number of things can happen all at once. Um, I would instance just a few. Um, vaccination against cholera. Uh, Timothy Dwight, the great divine of Yale University, still celebrated by Christian Americans, uh, denounced vaccination against cholera because it was an interference with God's design, which, if you believe in God's design, I presume it is. Uh, but there were people, Thomas Jefferson among them, who thought, very good idea to bring Dr. Jenner's discoveries and spread them throughout the United States. In fact, Jefferson even helped to work out how to keep the vaccine cool as he realized it lost its potency when it traveled in hot climates. Uh, one might instance Sir Joseph Priestley, the discoverer of oxygen, whose laboratory in Birmingham in England was smashed and broken up and burned out by a, a Christian mob, a pro-monarchist, church and king mob, as they called themselves. Looked, looked at the wreckage of his laboratory and thought, I'm going to Philadelphia. Uh, they can't shut me up there. Thomas Paine came the same way, wafted across the Atlantic, carrying a letter from guess who, Dr. Benjamin Franklin. In some way, this extraordinary synthesis was occurring, and Jefferson was a very important part of it, and it was a question of taking, as, as I say, scientific and moral and medical uh, responsibility. And it's perhaps no accident that it was in that atmosphere that the American Anti-Slavery Society was founded with Mr. Payne and Mr. Franklin as, and Dr. Rush as among its earliest uh, members. And one of the things that makes Jefferson hard to write about, especially in a short form, is that he takes part in this Enlightenment moment. Uh, here's one way of putting it, by the way, between parentheses. If you want to be either exalted or depressed, I don't know which it would be. In the American election of 1796, the electorate had its choice between two candidates. One was the president of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and the other was the founder of the American Academy of Arts and Letters. <laughs> the candidacy seemed to have shriveled a bit since then, I think they were <laughs> Not only that, under the 1796 rules, you could vote for both of them because the runner-up would be your vice president, and that's what the electorate did. It was a limited electorate, I will admit, but still, it had a rather handsome choice. 
Um, as I reverting to what I was saying about Jefferson, not only taking part in this extraordinary moment of the Enlightenment, not only rewriting John Locke when he came to compose the Declaration of Independence and changing life, liberty, and property, Locke's trivium or uh, triad or trico of ideas into a formulation that I know you don't need me to tell you about. Um, not only after that, leading Virginia through a very perilous period of revolutionary war, uh, then becoming minister to France. When that moment begins, his ministership to France in 1787, <coughs> he's almost continuously in power after, afterwards for 25 years. And that's before he founds the University of Virginia and before he takes a razor to the New Testament to produce the Jefferson Bible, cutting out all the idiot that is fantastic or wicked or mythical or stupid mm -hmm. or incredible, thus leaving himself with a very short edition, <laughs> which you can now get from the Unitarian Church, uh, more or less for free. Uh, it's an extraordinary thing to have to uh, try and comprehend in one life. You can write a short life of Abraham Lincoln, you can, or of George Washington, you can. You have to struggle to write a short one um, about Mr. Jefferson. My, my view is approximately this. Um, the other day in Berkeley, it was decided to rename the Jefferson Elementary School um, for reasons I, I'm sure you can guess, good comrades. Uh, how, how could Berkeley lower itself to have a school named after a slaveholder and adulterer? And, uh, uh, to uh, Sequoia School, Sequoia Elementary. And I thought, I could, get, I could get angry about this. I could try and be funny about it, after all. Why not? The trees were there first. It's an arboreal republic. Um, or I could just say, who cares what they think? It doesn't matter because there wouldn't be a United States. Uh, there wouldn't be a, a United States extending as far as Bishop Berkeley had in fact imagined it one day would to the Pacific Coast, materialized by Thomas There wouldn't be any of this if it wasn't for Thomas Jefferson, which is why I have to quick, quickly mention war and revolution and, uh, and it's, it's awful corollary. Um, Jefferson had what I would describe as an almost Leninist attitude to inter-imperialist contradictions. The United States was to the northeast coast of North America, what Chile is to the southwestern coast of the southern cone, a long ribbon-like, literal, you might say, state uh, or republic, a trap between the ocean and the mountains, the Andes doing duty for the Alleghenies in the ca case of uh, Chile. Um, three great empires, the British, the French, and the Spanish held most of the rest of the continent and the Caribbean, and the approaches to the Atlantic. And there was no reason at all to suppose that the American Revolution would survive uh, in anything like its present form and, unless someone could manage very, very coldly and rationally and cynically to manipulate the rivalries between Britain and France and Spain and to wait for the moment when the essential thing had to happen, that the United States would get control of the Mississippi Basin. And only then could it become a serious country with its own rights to trade, its own rights to self-defense. And the ways in which Jefferson managed to manipulate this are most extraordinary. All of his sympathies were with the French Revolution. His sympathy for that was practically Leninist as well. He wouldn't hear a word said against it. His view was that the, the French Revolution should be defended at all costs, at all hazards. It didn't matter how many lives it took. It didn't matter how much suffering. There was another republic in the world. It owed its ideas uh, and its principles to the American Revolution. And it, it was a matter of more than something more than kinship and solidarity uh, to defend it at all costs. This got him into tremendous political trouble. But when it looked as if the French might wish to continue to hold on to New Orleans, he sent his envoys to Paris and said, if you continue to do this, we will without hesitation make an alliance with the British Empire and the British fleet. Uh, we will turn on you because New Orleans and the Mississippi matter more to us than anything else. And further charged his envoys with a secret budget with which he didn't bother to trouble Congress um, to bargain for the Louisiana Territory, and in the end to get it all, and as Henry Adams, who puts it best, phrases it, to double the size of the United States in one day at 10 cents an acre. And that, that uh, announcement was made in the Gazette in Washington, D.C. on the 4th of July, nicely enough, and later on that same afternoon, Messrs. Lewis and Clark received their commissions to embark for Pittsburgh and for the West on the same day. Because Jefferson wasn't just improvising, he had a plan for a long time. 